Well, good morning, everyone. I hope that uh, you are all well and that your loved ones are as well during this challenging time. Um, welcome to our 2020 Smart Center Speaker Series virtual version. Um, today, we're excited to bring you Dan Lozen from the Center for Civil Rights Remedies at the University of California, Los Angeles as our uh, third in our series of speakers brought to you by the School Mental Health Assessment Research and Training Center here at the University of Washington. Um, our first um, speaker in the speaker series um, was our colleague Carol Davis from the UW College of Education, which is one of the two UW-based uh, entities that comprise the SMART Center. Um, she did a fantastic job. Um, Dan is the third scheduled speaker in our speech speaker series. Uh, we unfortunately had to postpone our colleague Rhonda Neese from the University of Oregon due to the coronavirus pandemic, but we will host her, um, whether it's in person or virtually, some way or another, uh, to give her talk on using preventative practices to disrupt the school to prison pipeline uh, this fall when we resume the speaker series um, after the summer. Um, thankfully for today, we were able to mobilize and trans, uh, uh, kind of transport our speaker series over to Zoom, um, and we're able to bring our third speaker in our planned series, uh, Dan Lozen, to us. Next month, we are thrilled um, to bring our state's superintendent of public schools, Chris Rakedahl, um, to the speaker series for our final installment of our spring uh, series. And uh, Chris will be talking about um, attempting to provide students and others access to effective school mental health in an era of COVID. Um, what kind of lessons have been learned um, from uh, his experience and that of his state here in Washington state. <clears throat> Real quick, um, and uh, as Megan is uh, referencing from the in the chat box for everyone who's joined, um, please feel free to register to receive future announcements about this and other events from the Smart Center. One last thing to uh, point out, which is that um, our speaker series is brought to you in part by the Institute for Education Sciences um, in the U U.S. Department of Education, as well as the um, uh, our, our Northwest Mental Health, Te Mental Health Technology Transfer Center that is hosted here at the SMART Center. Um, Dan has got control of the slides. Dan, if you could go up one uh, slide earlier, that would be great, um, to the little splash page about the SMART Center. Oh, go up uh, two previous slides. The first purple one. We, uh, this one? we trust Dan so much, we gave him uh, control over the PowerPoint. Um, yeah, go up to the one where we get to show all of the members of the Smart Center in their um, holiday regalia. Just before we get started, thanks, Dan. Um, Want to kind of let everyone know what the Smart Center is. Uh, it's been remarkable. Our first talk with uh, Carol Davis was on the campus of the University of Washington. We had over 100 people show up. But we are um, well over 100 now, it looks like, in terms of uh, participants. And um, you know, one uh, silver lining of all of this disruption that the uh, pandemic has caused is, is that um, we are able to reach so many more folks through these kind of virtual um, meetings. So just a little bit about us. The SMART Center is indeed a collaboration between the College of Education and the School of Medicine uh, at the University of Washington. And uh, our mission is to promote high quality, culturally responsive programming to meet the full range of social, emotional, and behavioral needs of all students. And we do this through research, training, technical assistance, and support to policymaking, as well as probably some other things I haven't thought of. Go ahead now to the next slide, Dan. Uh, so there's a little picture of some of us uh, last holiday season uh, before our lives were uh, thrown fully into tumult. Um, but you can find us virtually simply by Googling UW Smart Center or going to our URL, uh, which is right there in front of you. And a little note that all of these slides will be available for folks to, uh, to take a look at. All right, advance one more, Dan, and we're gonna bring you on stage here. Thanks very much. 
I think Dan may be wearing the exact same jacket uh, when we when we see him in the video uh, as he is in this picture. I want to introduce Dan, who I've uh, whose work I have been reading for some time, but who I only had the uh, pleasure to meet just a few days ago as we were preparing for this talk. Dan Lozen. Uh, or Daniel J. Lozen, I should say, is director of the Center for Civil Rights Remedies, an initiative at the Civil Rights Project at the University of California, Los Angeles. And he has worked at the Civil Rights Project since 1999, when it was affiliated with Harvard Law School, where he was a lecturer uh, on law. So Dan's work um, aligns really well with that of the Smart Center. It concerns the impact of law and policy on children of color and language minority students. Among many other projects, Dan works to reveal and redress the school to prison pipeline and protect the rights of English language learners to equal educational opportunity. On these and related topics, he conducts law and policy research, publishes books, reports, and articles, and works closely with federal and state legislators to inform legislative initiatives. Among these efforts, he's uh, worked with at least one district here in Washington State, the Vancouver School District, to address racial disparities in discipline there, following an action by the state's attorney general. He is aiding the development of the district's action plan and will continue to help monitor the implementation. So we're happy to have his presence here in our home state. Uh, just to conclude, before becoming a lawyer, uh, Mr. Lozen taught in public schools for 10 years, including working at a, as a a school founder of an alternative public school. And uh, he now provides guidance to dozens of policymakers, educators, and advocates at the state and district levels. Um, we will be doing Q&A or question and answers with uh, Dan after his presentation. So feel free to use the chat box throughout his presentation. We're gonna uh, wrap up the formal talk around um, 9.15 or so and have as much as half an hour for those who can stay on to do Q&A um, with Dan. Um, so with that, join those of us here at the Smart Center um, in welcoming Dan Lozen. Take it away. Uh, thank you, Eric, and all the staff at the Smart Center and all of you who are joining this webinar. It's a real uh, privilege and honor to be able to present to you and I'm hoping that you'll find it uh, helpful in your, either your research or your practice. And um, a little bit more about me is that um, I was a teacher for 10 years, as Eric mentioned, but I was also that teacher that was sending kids to the principal's office right and left. So I was fortunate to have uh, started my teaching in a school district that did support supply or provide support for teachers and very good training in classroom management and without which I would have really uh, continued to struggle. Um, so I've, you know, walked the walk on many of the things that I'll be uh, speaking about, even though they don't, uh, they didn't then have the terms um, associated with them. Uh, a lot of the kinds of changes that we're talking about um, that would affect how people teach are ones that I was able to benefit from because I received good training. Um, so I'm gonna begin by talking about sort of from 20,000 feet up, looking at some of the descriptive data that describes the racial and disability disparities um, around the school to prison pipeline uh, to really drive home the magnitude of the problem and talk about it in terms of the impact on education. Um, and then I'll talk about some of the law and policy, and then I'll um, focus the rest of the time uh, discussing the remedies, uh, some of the work I've done in several different districts. Um, and uh, hopefully that will, uh, you'll find that to be um, useful for your own work. Um, so, I'm, I, I usually start with national data, but I thought in this case, I should start with some of the data from districts in the state of Washington. Now these data are from 2015-16. They're collected from the US Department of Education's Office for Civil Rights. And these are data that just describe the numbers of students who were suspended at least once and you divide that by their enrollment to get what we call the risk. It's really just a straight percentage of the students who were suspended at least one time. 
that this is a very conservative rate, but even using this very conservative rate, when we drill down in the data and look at the district level, but at the secondary level, so that's middle schools and high schools, um, and we look at race and disability in, Was in the state of Washington, these are the unduplicated uh, risks for suspension for black students with disabilities in 15-16. So you'll see Holyalup District, I don't know if I pronounced that correctly, that, that, re that 50 percent really means that half of the black students with disabilities at the secondary level were suspended at least one time. Um, if you go down, you can see, I know Renton, there are a number of people who had registered who are from Renton, 37 percent. Uh, Spokane, 34 percent. So you can, you can see Vancouver was very high at 46 percent. These numbers really should shock our consciousness, but um, our conscience, I should say. Um, but oftentimes we lose, in looking at numbers, we sort of lose a sense that there are real kids behind these numbers who are um, very much, their educational opportunities are being impacted by this. So one of the things that I've moved, shifted towards in my own uh, research, and I do a lot of descriptive report writing, is not just to look at these underlying rates, but to look at um, the data on that cap better captures both the number of suspensions and the duration, because we know both kids with disabilities and the kids who sus are suspended more often than others are often within a given year suspended several times, and that adds up as well. And, and oftentimes there's maybe a slightly longer duration uh, or just the cumulative um, numbers of suspensions adds up to much more um, much larger differences in terms of the instructional time that they lose, um, often because of minor infractions. And we'll talk about how to disaggregate the data by the type of infraction towards the end. Um, <clears throat> so it's really important, and most districts do have the capacity because they have to report on the duration um, of suspensions under both the state law as well as under federal. IDEA requirements, and the Office for Civil Rights is now collecting and reporting this, these data as well. That's, and it's very simple calculation. You take the total days lost and you divide it by uh, the enrollment and you get a rate of lost instruction per 100 students that you can compare from one district to the next. Um, and you can look at how much lost instruction is due to uh, violations of you know, some of the more minor codes of conduct. Uh, in Vancouver, we used, I was able to look exactly at how much each code of conduct um, contributed to the disparities in the amounts of lost instruction. And I'll talk about that more at the end. It's also important because as a former teacher and um, someone who helped start a school, I know that in, instructional time matters. We all understand that. But it really, I think, resonates with educators more than when you just talk about rates of suspension. Um, it really captures the full impact on the opportunity to learn. It's also important be because I think it resonates more and people can understand more easily why we need to reduce the impact of discipline on instruction. It's more likely, I think, that I, when you're looking at days of lost instruction on a regular basis, you're going to get more buy-in towards making changes because the changes are designed, hopefully, uh, in terms of discipline reform, designed to improve or, or to, to have less lost instruction. And I think that's especially um, something pe people are gonna be aware of after so all the schools closing and ha having to deal with all the students losing tremendous amounts of instructional time. Um, imagine when we go back to school, if in the first week of school, kids are getting removed and losing even a, more instructional time after being out for so long. So I think this in some regards that um, as we do return to school, and hopefully that will happen in the fall, it's not guaranteed, of course, um, but when it does happen, and eventually it will, that they'll um, that educators will be even more 
um, sympathetic to um, minimizing the amount of lost instructional time for any reason. Um, there's also a reason to believe, I would say, that we'll see more behavioral problems when students do return. Uh, a lot of students, you know, who have lost loved ones or experienced trauma by being exposed to uh, violence in the home or other dysfunctional aspects of living at home um, for extended periods. Um, there may be new mental health issues. Uh, there are students who, you know, there's going to be serious implications uh, in terms of hunger. Um, there are students who will um, experience a loss of instructional time more than others and have, you know, struggle more. So there'll be more frustration. Um, and I've always pointed out um, that students with disabilities, because they're getting so much more when they're in school, they're also, for every day of lost instruction, they're actually losing even more than a student without disabilities because of all the additional supports that they do get. Um, so it's, and that is probably it, more difficult to provide for their needs in terms of whatever online uh, or virtual instruction they were receiving in the, in the in midterm. So here's how we construct the data. As I mentioned, you, um, this is the national data from 2015-16. And this slide just focuses on the black and white difference nationally. Um, and so black students lost 64 days, K through 12. 64 days for every 100 black students enrolled and white students, it was 13. So the, the racial gap means that black students lost 41 more days than their white peers lost. And you can see the elementary and secondary level breakdown here. Um, I won't read every detail on these slides, um, so you can just take a look at it. But there's a tremendous increase in the use of suspensions when we get to junior high and high school and middle school and high school. And you can see that here in terms of the, the size of the gap um, goes from a 20 day difference to an 82 day difference. That's just tremendous. And that's nationally at the secondary level that, 80, that black students are losing 82 days more of instructional time. And this is just due to out of school suspension. So it doesn't count expulsions. It doesn't count in school suspension or disciplinary transfers in these data. In the state of Washington, uh, take a moment to really uh, look at this slide. This is what the state of Washington's lost instruction time broken down by race. Now, it's also true that um, most districts and I believe the state of Washington, you can look at race and disability together, but not with the OCR data. That's the federal data that, that I'm uh, use, used in this slide. So uh, you, uh, see that the last column where it says 91 is days of lost instruction for students with disabilities. Um, and that's, again, uh, this, this is, you know, just for the state of Washington. Um, and this is, I believe, at the secondary level. I don't think it says it on the slide, but I should have. Now, it is among what the state of Washington for several of these groups and uh, oddly not for black students, although it's in, in the top half of compared to all other states, but for several of these other groups, it was among the top 10 um, in terms of the highest rate of loss instruction due to out of school suspension. And you can see the disparities pretty easily. You can compare, you know, black students at 109 at the highest to any of these other groups. Um, you know, white students were at uh, 30, I, um, not uh, 76 is for Native Americans. It's, just, it's a little bit similar pattern, but um, so there's a you know 60. I mean, I'm sorry, uh, 79 more days lost by Black students across the state. Um, uh, before we get into some of the district data in more detail, I also want to point out that. You know, across the nation, there has there have been many states that are engaged in efforts to reduce uh, the use of suspensions and the disparities. Um, however, one of the areas of concern is that more kids may be getting pushed into alternative schools. Now, these data again are from 2015-16, but 
but you'll see that the rates of loss instruction are much, much higher in these alternative schools, most of which are supposed to be staffed by folks who have some higher degree of experience and, and expertise in addressing behavioral issues, yet they're using suspension much, much more often, and the impact is even greater uh, at the alternative schools. And look at students with disabilities. Um, when we look at, I, this is broken down by males and females, but if you look at the bottom row where it says combined, you'll see that students with disabilities in our alternative schools are losing 148 days per every 100 students enrolled. And if that's confusing to people because it's over 100, remember, this is not a straight percentage. Um, you know, this is 148 days per every 100 students enrolled. Um, and so those numbers can be much higher than 100, but anything, any numbers, uh, you know, over, over the, say, the national average for all students, I would consider high, and these numbers are just incredibly high um, and very, very disturbing. Now, I don't, I didn't break it down for the state of Washington, um, because these, this analysis looked at individual schools and combined them nationally. Um, so I would have to do that for each state. Um, and that's something I might be able to do in the future. There's new data that are expected out. Uh, and there's a sheet that you'll see distributed with a link to the OCR webpage. Um, but a lot of the data that I'm gonna talk to use that data as a source, but there was a di additional analysis uh, conducted and we have the sort of the researchers database. So there's nothing redacted. Um, this again is secondary level, state of Washington, um, different school districts. And this just looks at students with and without disabilities. Remember um, for, for the OCR data, you can't look at race with disability on this one indicator, but you can, uh, the state of Washington has its database um, and I believe you are able to do it uh, with their data, but it's more complicated than that. Um, anyhow, uh, this gives you an idea of what things look like. And you can, I'm not gonna read through all of these. Many of these, uh, I looked at the sort of invite list or the, the participants list, and many of you came from one of these districts and that's why I selected them. <clears throat> um, and you can just see the disparities. We may re return to this, but I always find it's really useful to just compare when you're doing comparisons to look at the underlying values. So these are rates of loss instruction, students with disabilities in blue, and in the orangey color, it's students without disabilities, without the racial dimension, which means that if we were looking at black students with disabilities in most of these districts, this amount of loss instruction would be even higher because just about everywhere you look, the black rate of loss instruction among students with disabilities is higher than the white rate of loss instruction. So this is, these are the aggregates and the comparison group is students without disabilities. Um, I'm hoping that most people, even in Lake Washington School District, which has, you know, one of the, some of the lowest rates of loss instruction, but still find these disturbing. Um, although certainly if you're in places like Tacoma or Spokane or Renton, you know, it would be progress to get your rates down to what we see in the Lake Washington School District. Um, those rates may have changed since then as well. So again, we're looking, this is a snapshot in time, um, so it doesn't reflect current practices. <clears throat> this is more recent data, and this is from the Va Vancouver School District. And I, because they do collect the data, I was able in my work with them to look more closely at the secondary level at, um, black students and other racial subgroups of students with disabilities. And this just gives you an example. Um, there are 194 days of loss instruction for black students with disabilities and white students at 69. And that's a high number. 69 is a high number already. So the fact that there's 130 days more loss instruction for the black students with disabilities should be an I believe is, uh, been working with the folks in Vancouver and they're very much concerned about these numbers and uh, committed to uh, doing some changes to their, their policies and practices. Um, 
oftentimes people, when they see these data, ask if they're accurate. And in every case that I've presented so far, the data have been signed off and certified as accurate. That doesn't guarantee their accuracy. Um, and there, it is very important to be collecting these data. Another area where we see uh, much larger issues with inaccurate data are when we're looking at referrals to law enforcement and school-based arrests. And there's also concerns about students who are being told to go home and come back in a few days, but not officially recorded um, as being suspended. And that has important implications in terms of how we track the loss instruction for some of the procedural requirements under the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act and Section 504. Um, and it also means that when we're trying to examine and find out where their problems are, as well as which schools and districts are doing well, if they're off the book suspensions or if students are being referred to you know, the school police or the SROs or security guards and disciplines being handled in that way, um, it, that might actually be distorting the data in ways that is, uh, you know, confounding to any kind of analysis. And the fact is that across the nation, even though it was a required element, and it's also required in the Every Student Succeeds Act, um, the data on referrals to law enforcement and school-based arrests are often missing. And that's actually a violation of Title VI of the uh, Civil Rights Act of 1964 because it's a required element for reporting to the Office for Civil Rights. Another area um, is the area of in-school suspensions where sometimes those data are not accurate. Um, there's also a related issue, um, which we'll get to when we talk about disability law, which is whether or not when you suspend a student in school, are they really getting uh, adequate access to the curriculum such that it shouldn't count as um, when we're looking at counting days of lost instruction for the purposes of the procedural protections. And we'll talk more about that later. I just want to flag that issue. Um, but this really adds, as we're facing resources, resource issues, and they're going to get worse before they get better, nationally and the state of Washington and all the districts, um, there has been this push in the wake of the shootings at uh, Marjorie Stoneham Douglas High School in Broward County, Florida and elsewhere to add more police. Um, and even some money from the US Department of Education that has been provided through grants, but some states have also provided funding and also districts decide on, uh, oftentimes have a lot of control over their uh, security guards, SROs, uh, law enforcement officials that, and, and that comes oftentimes out of the education budget. And, you know, we already, I think, can all agree that students, when they return, are going to need more supports and more services, and teachers are going to need more, and administrators as well, to be successful. And there's going to be a budget crunch. And I think it's really important uh, especially in this time of scarce resources, but I would be saying this even without, um, you know, the, uh, the virus crisis, um, that <clears throat> we really need to examine how we're allocating our education dollars and think about the trade-offs. In a forthcoming study uh, that we're about to publish in a report on the state of California, we looked at um, OCR data and found that there was a positive correlation between the number of security staff or the staff to student security staff to student ratio and the days of lost instruction and it was strongest when we looked at uh, days of lost instruction for black students so there's some implications in other words that we could actually be adding to the problems when we're adding police and you know I understand that students need to be safe but we also have to think about safety in all its ramifications. Students who are, um, you know, having uh, unaddressed um, mental health issues are not safe. Students who are being discriminated against are not safe. And students who are being, you know, hauled off uh, off campus to jail are also, that's not a safe situation, especially when it's not, uh, when a, an officer may intervene in a way that's not appropriate. and we've all seen uh, some of the videos that suggest that can be happening in some places. 
So here is uh, some work I did in, the, in Maine. Um, and just to show some of the disparities there, I don't have the data analyzed for the state of Washington doing this comparison, but you can see that for students with disabilities, these are districts that actually, I was only looking at districts that actually reported at least their referrals to law enforcement. Some of them had um, <clears throat> uh, zeros in some categories, but they all had some referrals recorded. And you can see in the second column that students with disabilities, this is a different, uh, this is the risk for being referred. And so it's not days of lost instruction and it's per thousand students, not per 100. So it's not a, a percentage, um, but it gives, it gives you a good idea of the much higher rate as a percentage, for example, our, that's regional school, I think it's Union District 25, um, means that the, as a percentage, it would be over a fifth, almost a quarter of the students with disabilities were referred at least once to law enforcement in that district in Maine. But having these data is really important um, when we're considering, uh, you know, looking at discipline reform efforts. Um, we don't want to see what I call the whack-a-mole problem where as there's efforts to reduce the use of suspensions, if we don't pay attention to these data, we may see in districts that are maybe more resistant that they're willing to be um, vocal about, but are resisting these efforts, you may see they, that, you know, there's a, all of a sudden an uptick in the referrals to law enforcement or, you know, off the book suspensions or in-school suspensions. Um, and it's important to, to look at several slices of discipline and discipline related uh, data together to make sure that the problem isn't just being shifted around, but, you know, because ideally when effective reforms are being implemented, you really are improving the conditions of learning. The school climate is improving such that you're preventing some behaviors and your responses to others are less punitive and more constructive. And that's, it should be a win-win situation. So there shouldn't be this need to just shift the problem around if you're really doing so the meaningful uh, efforts, uh, you know, if you're engaged in meaningful efforts. So I'm going to um, look at some of the relevant laws and regulations and uh, federal and state guidance. Now, I won't cover these in detail. Um, so let's just uh, walk through some of them. And again, a lot of the links to these, um, especially guidance and some of the uh, both state and federal guidance are provided for in um, a set of links that will be uh, posted online. <clears throat> so it's important to realize that there are many different types of race and disability discrimination. Uh, you, may, you may have heard of situations where uh, there are blatantly hostile environments to certain groups of students. And that would look like, you know, kids uh, who are harassed racially and file complaints and nothing happens, um, or um, there's uh, either an administrator or a teacher who is, you know, making, this is the most blatant kind of, you know, racial discrimination, where they're, you know, using epithets or making derogatory comments and those sorts of things, and, and where nothing is really being done or it's being tolerated or put up with. Then there's, um, Moving back from the to sort of the blatant, most obvious examples, there's different treatment of similarly situated children. So that would be where you're um, either because of implicit bias or maybe there's some form of explicit bias. But for the same kinds of offenses, um, white students don't get suspended. Maybe they don't even get referred, uh, but black students do. And we've I've seen this in and participated in investigations uh, as well of school districts when I was intern for the Office for Civil Rights. So <clears throat> I know what this looks like as well. And usually you find this when you do a file review and you find, or occasionally you can see this when you're looking at the reasons for students are being suspended. And you find that let's say only black students get, sus get um, you know, suspended for a certain type of conduct or, or they only call the police when 
um, a black student commits a certain type of violation, but never um, when it's a white student involved. Um, there's been research that's looked at fights between black and white students uh, that looked at 12 years of data across the state of Louisiana and did find that black students who had been involved in fights with white students for the same incident uh, did get longer, uh, slightly longer suspensions. <clears throat> but different treatment is one very isolated kind of discrimination. Um, and there are other kinds that are really important. Uh, the most obvious one that many people have heard about is implicit racial bias or unconscious racial bias. And so this isn't gonna show up very easily as a clear instance of different treatment where it's just about race. But because the way implicit bias works, it affects your perceptions as well as your responses. So it involves who you're looking at. Uh, more often and who you're suspecting and your behavioral expectations may be, be being lower for black kids or students with disabilities. Um, so it's maybe that um, for the same behaviors, you're either more tolerant or you don't even regard it as problematic when white students are engaged in that kind of behavior. Maybe it's roughhousing, but when it's black students, maybe you're um, more likely to write it up as a fight or send the kids to the office. and. It may be just subtle differences, and most people, um, including myself, so I've taken, um, there's an online test you can take to see if you have implicit racial, negative racial bias towards blacks, black, not students, but blacks in general. And I, as a civil rights lawyer, have to admit that I, you know, came out with slightly negative racial bias against blacks. And there are black folks that have taken this and also it's it, implicit bias is in the air we breathe. It's not a conscious decision to to treat people differently, but it results in different treatment. And it's about how you um, not not only perceive, but also your response might be more harsh. There was a study done by uh, Jason O'Connor, uh, who's now at Stanford, where they uh, had a narrative about student behavior and they just put a black sounding name on the top of it or a white sounding name and they asked all these secondary teachers how they would respond and for the first time they said it was pretty much even Stevens but when they said this is the second time a student has committed this misconduct um, uh, many more teachers said the black student should be suspended and so you know these are um, and, and you know that kind of uh, bias is noticed when you do that kind of large scale review. It's harder to see when um, you're just looking at isolated instances. Then there are other kinds of um, of discrimination. You know the distribution of resources. Um, it goes to hiring of teachers. I'll I'll, I'll talk about this um, a little bit more when we talk about uh, disparate impact. Um, disparate impact, though, is mostly focused not on bias of individuals, but on how a policy, the effects of a policy or practice, where you're assuming that there wasn't any intentional discrimination, or there's no different treatment. And so you, it, the way you would analyze disparate impact is very different than how you would look at different treatment. Disparate impact, though, the way to keep it clear in your mind is to think about it's where a policy has a negative impact and then the question becomes whether the policy is justified and I'll go through that in a little bit more detail. Then there's also the, for kids with disabilities, denying a free appropriate public education, uh, shorthand FAPE denial, is also considered discrimination on the basis of disability. So, um, Let's talk a little bit more about some of the resources out there. So this is uh, one really important one that sort of looks at the, <clears throat> the racial uh, forms of discrimination of different treatment and disparate impact was described in great detail with many examples and a joint guidance released by um, the Department of Justice and the Office for Civil Rights. And that's been rescinded by the Trump administration, but the time uh, 15 state attorney general spoke out in favor of that guidance. And um, you, many states, including Washington, now 
have adopted in their own policies much of what was in that guidance, if not all of it. Um, now, unfortunately, rescinding that um, the guidance, that decision was not reviewable in court. But many of the same arguments used to rescind the the, the, the joint discipline guidance was used when the Trump administration. Um, I'm skipping down to the, set, the third bullet when they tried to. Um, hold off on the new regulations from 2000, 2016 on racial disparities in special education. And when a judge did review those reasons, which again were similar to the reasons given for rescinding the discipline guidance, the federal court found the reasons to be arbitrary and capricious. So that's just important to keep in mind. Uh, the state of Washington has a whole set of um, their own guidelines, um, which I recommend folks read if you haven't already, uh, which really do adopt most of what, or probably all, and maybe some more additional pieces in there in terms of the, um, the guidance. The guidance actually came as a whole package with all kinds of technical assistance, <clears throat> and the state of Washington has uh, provided a great deal of that. Then there's also um, guidance in around kids with disabilities and what to do with regard to uh, some of the procedural issues, which I'll be discussing in a little, in a little bit more detail. Uh, but I recommend folks look at the guidance letter dated August 1st, 2016, which has not been rescinded. And it speaks to the school discipline issues for students with disabilities. Um, the state of hey, Washington. Dan. Yes. This is Kelsey. This is just a notice to let you and the participants know we've got about 10 minutes left of your presentation. And then oh. we're going to move to question and answer. Mm. So if people listening have questions, we already have several um, in the Q&A uh, feature. But if you're listening and have questions you want us to ask Dan, um, now would be a good time um, to get those in and queued up for that period. So Yeah, and I might need to go five, five minutes into that. <laughs> because that's, that's fine. Okay, um, <clears throat> sorry, I lost track of the time a little bit. So one of the things that I do when I work with districts, I'm gonna not go into this one in detail, but um, we look at data to along the lines of these legal theories and that's really important to do. So um, if you're looking for different treatment, one of the things you would definitely wanna look at is the referral rate of certain teachers and to look at whether certain teachers um, are referring mostly black students or if some never refer any white students, um, those sorts of things, or the same kind of thing, disparities with kids with disabilities. Um, in working with Vancouver, we found that about half of the referrals seem to be coming from out of the classroom. So it's important to consider what um, the referrals from other staff, um, there were some incomplete data as well, and that's really important that districts be gathering this information because a deeper dive, really, you can't look at it from you know 20,000 feet up when you're looking for different treatment. You really need to look at the context. You need to think about individual teachers, um, and also compare kids and do you know? Ideally, you would pull their different files to look for examples of similarly situated students who are being punished differently. Um, <clears throat> disparate impact is the kind of discrimination that really gets to the systemic policies and practices. So one of the things that you would be looking at is, um, you know, the codes of conduct, um, also vagueness in the codes of conduct. That's where implicit bias can actually, uh, the, even though I think of that more as a different treatment issue, if code of conduct is worded so that there's a much more subjectivity than is needed. And that's where you see, you know, um, vague codes, like any kind of disruptive activity you can be suspended for. That allows for a lot more subjectivity and that's where implicit bias tends to play. Um, and I can come back in the Q&A to some of these other issues. <clears throat> but the core thing to remember is that you're not automatically assuming that it's discriminatory just because uh, there's a racial difference uh, or a disparity. You're asking, when you ask about disparate impact, whether this policy or practice is justified. So you're not asking whether black kids or kids with disabilities are misbehaving more often. You're 
it really goes to the justification. And many of these policies are not. And the, the example and the guidance was around attendance issues like truancy. Now, what, where's the sense of suspending kids who aren't even coming to school? It's not going to deter them. And research suggests that it actually will make, it, make things worse. So that would be hard to defend. Um, and many states are starting to eliminate that as grounds for suspension. But there, this can also, when you look at fighting, it can go to, uh, if you had an automatic policy, if you get five days, for example, for a fight, well, why five days? What's, where did that come from? Is it research-based? Is it justified? One at four. You should be able to justify every additional day, uh, you know, past the first day, even when it's, um, you know, based on something like fighting. So looking at some of the the systemic issues, the policies and the practices, um, even having principals have more autonomy and have their own codes of conduct in addition to whatever the district has can raise disparate impact issues, especially when you find that some schools are much harsher than others within the same district. Well, what is the reasoning behind that if it's producing a disparity? And remember, too, that um, we haven't gotten into all the research around the harms from out-of-school suspensions, but they're very well documented that they increase the risk of dropping out, of later uh, becoming involved in the juvenile justice system. But one of the reasons that I always uh, now use days of lost instruction is the immediate impact on lost instructional time is obvious. And for most educators, we don't have to you know, debate whether missing school is harmful. Um, <clears throat> so in the work in Vancouver and elsewhere, it's important to break down the code of conduct because there may be disparities under certain provisions, but not under others. Uh, in Vancouver, for example, I found that, you know, disruption and failure to cooperate contributed considerably to the amount of racial disparity. So I could show them that this particular policy was which may not be necessary or justifiable. So why do you suspend kids for failure to cooperate? That's the central question. And if you can't answer it, you can't say that kids are um, you know, more cooperative uh, because they've been suspended. Then you have to ask your question, why are we suspending kids for this reason? Isn't there a less discriminatory alternative? Um, and that's really important, whether or not there is a less discriminatory alternative. What else could be done outside of suspending students from school. Um, <clears throat> so one of the things to look at um, for disparate impact is whether certain codes of conduct can be eliminated or the length of suspensions um, lessened. Uh, the other thing to think about in terms of less discriminatory alternatives, and this is based on just in Vancouver, we looked at elementary and secondary individual schools and looked at the rates of lost instruction and found tremendous variation from one school to the next. So this does raise the question that some uh, schools within the district uh, don't have a, a problem with racial disparities, um, but others may. And so the answer may be right there in the district already. There may be schools operating in ways that don't produce large disparities and certainly um, have some best practices going on that are, could help reduce them. Um, <clears throat> it's also to look at the trends over time to detect possible problems. Uh, this slide gets into some of the details, but um, I'll just deal with the, the bigger picture. Um, so the, here in California, this is, we didn't, we did uh, look at this broken down further by race, but this also gets at, um, the backlash. Um, so when you're looking at codes of conduct um, in California, we were, they eliminated uh, first at grades K through three and now K through eight, the code of conduct called disruption or defiance. So the back row shows the change in suspensions. These are suspensions per 100. So this isn't days of lost. In, oh, maybe this is, wait a minute. Uh, this is, uh, uh, yeah, this is suspensions per 100. Um, and you can see across the state, the rates went down. And you can also see that um, the disruption only, which is the second column from the back, went down the most, um, but that the others didn't go up instead. Uh, and that's important in terms of 
whether something is really um, uh, having the desired impact um, and can be used, is this a successful alternative to eliminate this code of conduct? Well, in California, I would have to say the evidence suggests it was. In other words, the, this whole idea that we get chaos when we do that, um, reduce rates, um, did not bear out in the state of California. So why not? Why are we still suspending kids for disruption across the state of Washington if it's almost eliminated in the state of California? So that's a good example of a less discriminatory alternative. <clears throat> and it didn't result in more suspensions in other categories. Uh, here, this is a school, the Vancouver High School in uh, Vancouver, Washington. And this is just goes to the point about looking at trends over time. So we do set, tend to see when the end sizes are small, some volatility. So looking at trends over time is useful, but also averaging a few years together can also uh, reduce the, the volatility. But we can also ask, this raises questions, why did all the rates from 1516 to 1617 go down? And most of them continued to be low uh, for the 1617 school year, but now they're shooting up. So is there a policy change? Is it a new principle? So the using the trends um, can help you look for problems as well as thinking about solutions. So maybe they were doing something really well and they just moved away from that practice and the suspension rate started going back up. I don't know. This is the kind of, when you do a root cause analysis is the kind of data you want to look at. Um, uh, so I'm going to move on because uh, we haven't really talked about one of the most important things, which is that FAPE denial can have a disparate impact. So it's not justifiable if you're not following procedures. So for example, if you're not providing uh, manifestation determinations for kids with disabilities, um, that could be, um, you know, so failing to provide the appropriate due process um, when a student has with disabilities when it looks like you're going to suspend them for more than 10 days, so the procedural protection that kicks in um, requires that there be a review to see whether the, the, dis the behavior was disability caused or whether failure to implement the IEP may have either directly caused or related, is related to the reasons for the behavior. So substantially related. So it doesn't have to just be directly caused. It can be substantially related. And that is important to consider. It's often a question that if there's not a lawyer present at those meetings, it's often a question that doesn't really get asked. So um, it's something to look at and something I did look at and in Vancouver and in other districts. And uh, it's really important to consider that um, if you're not providing the procedural protections even though it's a procedural violation, it also substantially can, can, can rise to a substantial denial of free appropriate public education. Um, so this goes to whether or not there were functional behavioral assessments, uh, whether there were behavioral improvement plans, and especially after there was a manifestation determination, if that was positive, that's, you have to have a behavioral improvement plan as part of the IEP. Um, and if you've already done a functional behavioral assessment, you might want to do another one or revise the behavioral improvement plan. But if you're not seeing evidence of that, that is not only a violation of IDA, if it's more likely that a black student didn't get the proper procedural uh, the, uh, uh, safeguards um, implemented correctly, then that could be contributing to the racial disparity as well. Um, there's also disparate impact along the lines of disability. So there's, you're violating the IDA, the Section 504, as well as potentially Title VI. So um, it's important to, we, we address a lot of these things uh, already, so I'm skipping ahead. <clears throat> um, let's see. So oftentimes we hear you get 10 free days, so you have to ask yourself, is that, is 10 free days regarding you can suspend the student with disabilities up to 10 days without having to provide any kind of procedural safeguards and it's okay to do that. Is that true? Is that false? Or does it depend? Um, now, 
for a long time, I probably would have chosen it depends, but I would say the real answer is nothing is free. So it's false. So even if you're talking about students that don't have a disabilities, when they miss school, there's always a cost. So we always should be thinking about whether this is in the best interest of the kids. And many of these suspensions um, are not justified. So, you know, whether it's for tardiness or whether it's for even, um, you know, smoking, uh, is, that, is that really gonna help uh, to suspend a kid for having a, a, a vaping device or something like that? I, I, I would uh, suggest that it's not. Um, that it's not an evidence-based response to just kick them out of school. <clears throat> but the other really important point um, is that once the school knows that the behavior is disability caused, there is no legitimate reason uh, to punish a student with disabilities for that behavior. So doing that is equal to punishing a student for having the disability. So even before the 10 days, once you know that the behavior in question is caused by the disability, it's not, it's not morally or legally acceptable. Now, it's different to think about what you can get away with, um, but it's still not uh, serving the spirit of the, the, the legal requirements uh, if you know that the behavior in question is caused by a disability and you're suspending the student from school anyway. <clears throat> So that's something to, to keep in mind. So I've always said, you know, once, once you know there are no days um, of, of lost instruction that are okay for that kind of behavior. Um, let's see, there's, uh, I don't have time to read it, but on the OSER's guidance, and you'll have the link, I strongly recommend that folks read pages six through nine of that guidance where it really gets into uh, all these examples. Um, and when is it okay and when is it not and so forth. <clears throat> um, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna skip over this. Uh, let's see. So in my work with Vancouver and other districts, I've worked with many districts across the country, it's really important to have good data uh, to be, so there have been issues there and in other districts where, you know, they just don't, they, they may be collecting data on say teacher referrals or manifestation determinations, but there's something incomplete about it. Um, and so we really need very good data and there should be an investment of, of resources in that so that we can use it. Um, and um, let's see, it's uh, really important to think about um, um, whether or not there is um, looking at both race and disability together, because those things can act in concert with one another. So it's not just looking at the procedural requirements. I think I'm repeating myself, but to look at whether or not, if they're not, if you're not providing for a free appropriate public education, if you're violating FAPE, if there's some sort of FAPE denial, is it more likely that the black students or the Native American students or the Hawaiian Pacific Islanders are having that experience? And if so, is that also contributing to some of these disparities and who winds up out of school? And I think the evidence certainly points in that direction in many, many districts. Uh, let's see. Um, so um, uh, let's see, I'm skipping ahead. So one of the things- So Dan, this yeah. is uh, Eric from Smart Center. While you're skipping ahead, we're gonna let you kind of wrap up with your summary points here. Okay. Um, but we just wanna let the uh, attendees know that uh, the webinar will go until, you know, a little before 10. You know, you've gone a little, over a little, we got a, a good number of questions that we wanna get at, that some of which might allow you to kind of get at some of the uh, points in more detail. So feel free to wrap up. I wanted to let everyone know that, um, we will be hanging in here until um, about 10 o'clock to get to Q&A. Okay. I've already talked a lot about the specific policy changes, changes the codes of conduct, ensuring that there are, um, you know, the procedural requirements of IDA are not just being met, but um, you can also do more. So, you know, the 10 day rule can become a five day rule in your district, especially if this is a problem to, and that's one of the suggestions I made Vancouver is that for all kids that there be a central review of any suspensions of more than three days 
<clears throat> and that's something that they are likely to adopt. In general, there's a lot of research, and I have a book um, on closing the school discipline gap um, that goes into some of the things that work, restorative practices, social emotional learning, uh, multi-tiered systems of support, um, the need to have culturally competent uh, responses is important, especially for uh, PBIS and other multi-tiered systems of support. We shouldn't, uh, we should make sure that there's a, a degree of race consciousness actually in all the things that we're doing when we're, uh, especially when the, we notice these large racial disparities. Um, there are teacher training programs that have been proven effective at both reducing suspensions and the racial disparities. Um, <clears throat> it's imperative that we provide the resources to implement these kinds of changes uh, effectively. So um, other things that I found in field research involve uh, greater parental outreach. Um, and across the board, uh, some of the things in common are that schools that invest in the relationships with parents um, and with students. So uh, training for teachers on, school, on student engagement has proven effective in a randomized controlled study. And in other uh, districts, investing in building those relationships with parents and the students has also helped um, uh, reduce suspensions as well as improve the school climate at the same time. So there shouldn't be any sacrifice in terms of whether people feel safe or not. Um, but again, all the solutions should have this sort of win-win component where you're, there's never a trade-off with safety um, that's involved. That, and, and usually um, we have seen uh, throughout, there have been several studies now that show, um, and one from Stanford University that shows that uh, there's a high correlation between higher achievement and lower suspension rates and vice versa. So one of the things that's really important, just to go back to the, um, is to really use the data effectively to provide, you need to look at, have some baseline data that are reliable, should be paying attention to data by race and disability and the confluence, should be looking at the data broken down by codes of conduct. <clears throat> it's important to measure um, progress in ways that are effective. I skipped over those slides, but basically looking at the absolute differences um, rather than at ratios and in the q and I can describe uh, a little bit why, more about why that's important. And uh, I always end with my, uh, my son, my oldest son, uh, when he was in kindergarten came back and said, Daddy, today I learned the Pledge of Illusions. Um, so, and I would say that, you know, in this case, the pledge of illusions, you know, when you're not looking at the data, you're not looking at it honestly, you're not look, you're covering over racial disparities rather than exposing them. The pledge of illusions ends with liberty and justice for none. Thank you. So questions. Thank you very much, Dan. I like the pledge of illusions and can only imagine how um, amazing that was when your little one came home with that uh, report from school. Yeah. I think I've experienced many of those uh, in my own life with my eight-year-old. Well, that um, was a ton to chew on, and we really appreciate um, the time you've spent with us. We're going to spend a little bit more time with you, Dan. We've gotten um, at least 18 tangible questions. Some of them have to do, as you ended there with, you know, kind of what are the different options for calculating disparity rates, absolute differences versus ratios and so forth. Another was about the efforts here in Washington State and the Smart Center. So we're gonna try and get to a few of those things and get a little deeper now. I'm gonna hand it over to my colleagues, uh, Kelsey Schmitz and Larissa Gaius, one of our postdoctoral fellows at the Smart Center to help facilitate and put some of these questions before you, Dan. But again, thank you very much for um, bringing your wisdom to bear. My pleasure. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Eric. Um, and thank you all so much for all of the questions that um, you submitted. I'm going, I've been trying to um, synthesize them to really capture some of the themes um, that have been that have been discussed in the questions. I think a lot of people are curious about um, the classroom level and thinking about um, how we can shift to really understanding more classroom level or grade level um, issues um, 
and how you know some of the data is really happening at maybe the school level or once people are already referred but it, how do we maybe capture data better at that classroom level and maybe intervene at the classroom level as well sure so <clears throat> um for interventions as i mentioned at the outset i received uh training in classroom management that really changed my life and certainly the life of the students in my classroom and i was one of those uh, uh, well, I already mentioned that I was having struggled. My, my principal came to me and said I had a classroom management problem. They had a course uh, designed to help de-escalate instead of, you know, calling kids out as being disrespectful. I was paying attention now to the ones who were being respectful and acknowledging that uh, in front of everybody. So that sort of positive reinforcement made a big difference. One of the other things that I did at the classroom level um, is in terms of you know parental outreach i made a list of all the students um, that i wasn't connecting with or ones i regarded as troublemakers and i looked for positive things in their behaviors and i called their parents um, and this was really a huge change in the dynamics because for many of these quote troublemakers this was the first time they got ever got a positive call about their son or daughter and um, I made sure it was just something really, you know, concrete. It didn't have to be amazing, but something really concrete. Um, so it wasn't just fluff. Uh, so, it w and the student also knew that I called their parents and said something positive about them. And so that changed the relationship considerably. And so when problems did um, rise up uh, that were more serious, the student and the parents knew that I had the best interests of their kid, that I saw their child in a positive light, and that I was really trying to help as a problem solver rather than just uh, someone who's trying to kick their kid out of the classroom. So that, that you know, th there are a lot of things in restorative practices that speak to that as well as positive behavioral intervention supports. Um, I think, what was the second part of the question? Oh, what can- oh, I was look wondering, in data terms data. of the data, like in terms of working on data mm -hmm. collection and monitoring yeah. at the classroom level. So PBIS has a Swiss data system and many districts now use, you know, either that or their own, but you can look at office disciplinary referrals. Uh, the problem I've seen in some districts has been that those data are not always accurate um, in terms of the person entering the data might be, you know, most of them come from the principal. So we're not actually seeing the, who made the referral. Also, uh, if you drill down to the, the reasons, uh, some investigations of, uh, for different treatment have found that, you know, if they're white kids or non-disabled kids, there might be some sort of mitigating statement with the referral slip and rarely find that with kids of color or kids with disabilities. So, that sort of su suggests a level of subjectivity um, that goes to maybe, you know, if you see a consistent pattern with something like that. Unfortunately, um, a, a lot of times we don't know if the referral was from a resource officer or, or, the, or a school teacher um, because the data are not tracked that carefully, even where they have the systems in place. So it's really important to emphasize that and to then review it and then, not not as a gotcha for the teacher uh, or the staff member, but as a way to get the, that person the kind of supports that I received when I was a first year teacher. Because you know I really believe that educators, when you call these issues to their attention, those who really care about kids are going to want to improve their practice. Great, thank you. I think relatedly, um, there were some questions that were about the integration of, and you mentioned MTSS and PBIS, but um, mm -hmm. the integration of um, practices or policies around inequitable discipline um, within systems such as MTSS and PBIS. Um, so I think that is one part of the question. And I think relatedly, um, how you see the role of individual biases within broader systems. So I just think that, um, you know, there's a lot of questions here about about the integration into more systemic policies, both in terms of something like behavioral supports as well as with biases, and maybe you can tackle those independently. Sure, uh, I'll go with the second one first, which is how does something like implicit bias, so this is where you see a confluence. I usually think of 
personal bias, implicit bias, even if it's not conscious, as a form of different treatment discrimination. Yet it can become disparate impact and systemic when it's, you know, we all, I, I think if we all took the implicit bias test, most people come out with some sort of negative uh, uh, feelings about black people specifically. But if, you know, they had one for Native Americans, it'd probably be the same. <clears throat> and so that, how does this inform policymakers? So there may be, um, you know, the most progressive policymakers on the school board, but there may still be a tendency to say, hire a harsh disciplinarian for the schools that have more kids of color or more low income kids um, to put more resource officers uh, in those schools. Um, and so there, there, there could be resources decisions along those lines. Uh, when we think about how the best teachers get assigned certain classrooms to the extent that there's tracking or gifted and talented programs, oftentimes we see the teachers with the highest uh, ratings um, internally getting those assignments. They're, they're teaching the gifted or AP classes and the students that are, you know, maybe need the best teachers, the ones that are struggling the most are getting the least experienced teachers. And we do see a correlation between level of experience and higher rates of suspension. So that's a way that, that you know, and, and oftentimes the AP classes and the gifted classes are also whiter and wealthier in terms of the students in those classes. So that's a, another way that it subtly can influence, um, you know, these systemic practices. And oftentimes the best teachers are also ones with very good classroom management skills, really good, uh, really powerful with working with individual students and and have you know all these excellent skills that would you know really be helpful for the kids who are struggling the most. So there's there's you know that's just one example. Um, I mentioned you know allowing the degree of autonomy to exist. So that's actually based on a OCR investigation of the Lodi Unified School District in California, where they found that there was a disparate impact because there's no reason to let principals in one school have much harsher discipline than another. There's no educationally sound or research-based reason for that. Um, <clears throat> the other thing in the classroom, implicit bias, um, and I, you know, I, I give the example, I think I already did about, you know, your perceptions of bias, but there was a study done by, another study done by the Child Study Center at Yale. This was a preschool kids, um, preschool teachers and preschool kids. And they found that when the teachers were prompted to look for signs of possible misbehavior, they were looking at, you know, a, a video with in four corners, you know, a black male, a white male, a black female, and a, and, a, and a white, and a black and white female male, four corners. Um, <clears throat> and they, you know, randomly organized depending on the trial. So they found that um, when prompted, most of the teachers would watch the black males. So that tells you that, um, and, and that included black preschool teachers, also that pattern. So if you're looking, even if the kids were equally misbehaving, if you're watching black males more than others, you're gonna see, it's gonna reinforce your bias and you're gonna think that the black males were misbehaving more when in fact you were just watching them more. Um, and I give the example personally, uh, growing up in a mostly white district, um, but my closest friend was African American, still is. And, <clears throat> you know, he once said to me, Dan, watch what happens when I walk into this store. And, um, you know, we both had our backpacks on, we were about 12, and all the eyes were on him. And, you know, even folks, salespeople come up, can I help you? And while well, no one was paying attention to me, and I got pissed off because it was clear that he was being, you know, treated uh, with uh, suspicion and I wasn't. So I said, you know what we're going to do? We're going back to that store. And, and we actually did this. The statute of limitations is over. And so while all the eyes were on my friend, I was loading up my backpack with all kinds of stuff. And we did this more than once. <laughs> but I was so angry. So you also have to think about how this affects, you know, students may not notice when they're in preschool, but eventually kids are going to notice that they're not being treated fairly, that the playing field is not level, 
and that even when they're doing the same things, they're, they're being treated more harshly. And over time, um, if that's going to make you, uh, as it did me, it's going to make you disrespect the system and not feel valued and, um, or in my case, you know, wanting to make them pay when you see this injustice going on. Um, and so that, you know, can also contribute to the relationships that uh, kids of color, kids with disabilities, others who are being discriminated against have. And it can lead to more misbehavior, but we don't think about it that way. We're always saying, well, you know, what are the behavioral ratings of the teachers? We're gonna control for that. And when we analyze for different treatment, when in fact, um, the buildup of being exposed to uh, implicit bias can really be very damaging. Thanks. Um, wondering if we can get to the question about the, in, the um, integration of inequitable disciplinary practices into a system such as MTSS or PBIS. Yeah, so one of the things that we, there's a couple of studies <clears throat> in our, well, one in particular in the book, but uh, other studies that I've read that have looked at PBIS, for example, where it didn't have a multicultural component and they found that the racial disparities were reduced but not, I mean, the, that the, um, this, I'm sorry, back up, the, uh, the level of suspensions, the rates of suspensions were reduced, but not the racial disparities. Now, in some cases that is true, and sometimes they can even expand. And, you know, I would say with all of these things, it's important to be looking at your data and looking at these racial differences and looking at the confluence of race and disability and reflecting on it on a regular basis, you know, quarterly or at least every half year should be looking at where you are and whether these differences are, um, you know, persisting. <clears throat> and that's where, you know, we, even in the state policy around uh, multicultural competence, there's a state law about it. But it doesn't specifically say we should be looking at the racial data in terms of the discipline when we're thinking about multicultural competence and training and you know behavioral expectations uh, responses to behavior all these things are really important so we know that one of the ways that racial bias implicit bias plays out is in how we respond what behaviors we're looking for are expectations as well as then how we respond and it may not you know by the time you have sent more black kids to the office so maybe they're treated equally at the office, but so we have to be thinking about who were those office disciplinary referral data are really important um, to look at as well and to look for patterns there and to reflect on our practices as individual teachers as well as systemically. But the sy systemic part of that is the data, the data aren't being used or they're not, and or if there's no, the you know, there's no attention to make sure that the data are accurate and which renders it, you know, useless when it shouldn't be, um, that's a problem that's, that, you know, the, the uh, and for many years when we considered, you know, racial inequity in education, discipline was actually off the, off on a, its own trajectory. It wasn't, um, it was a low priority. So we were looking at things like special education identification, but not discipline. We're looking at, you know, equitable access to experienced teachers, but not discipline. Uh, discipline was, and there's some legal reasons in the legal history for, for why that happened with regard to OCR, but um, I know for certain that OCR for many years would not look at racial disparities in discipline. So we've turned the corner on that for, uh, until the Trump administration, that is, um, but certainly in the state of Washington. So hopefully that answers the question. Thank you. We had a few specific questions about SROs um, and um, about that relation between SROs and school attendance slash and loss of instruction. Mm -hmm. um, what might be, so what might be some better budgetary expenditures to increase safety if not SROs? And this was a separate question from someone else. Is there any data regarding replacing SROs with social workers? There isn't on the last one, there's, it's, this is sort of a <clears throat> new phenomenon because, um, oh well, it started before the Marjorie Stoneham Douglas, uh, actually in the Obama administration after shooting, 
there was also um, additional funding where it could be spent on counselors or resource officers. <clears throat> and But no one's actually unpacked that data, so I don't have a good empirical sense of how the money has been spent. I do know in the state of California that money that's supposed to be designated for high needs kids and that there's a special supplemental concentration um, uh, sort of funding formula in the state of California. But some of the, in some of the districts there, the money is being spent on police without any justification. So this tendency to, you know, uh, especially after, you know, it's understandable, even if it's not supporting the research, to want uh, some sort of sense of greater security. And so people may be, the, the impetus is to hire more security guards after, you know, a school shooting. But the, the research really suggests that we're very inadequate in the supports for students, counselors, as well as special educators, nurses, um, you know, all those things. And so we need to make sure that um, in terms of keeping kids safe, you know, kids with emotional disturbance who aren't getting uh, adequate supports and services, they're going to act out in ways that, you know, there could be safety issues because of the lack of adequate counseling and supports and special educators. Um, and there is no evidence that adding school resource officers actually adds to safety because they can escalate if they're not well trained, they can escalate situations, they can actually um, you know, the opposite of the officer, officer friendly scenario where kids are distrustful of the police and there are more of them. So there be, they may be less forthcoming about um, a problem, a serious problem that's about to develop if they don't trust the system. And, you know, if you talk to a lot of people of color and others who have had bad experiences with policing, don't necessarily f feel safer when you add police and there's a whole history of, of course, racial profiling and abusive policing, especially, um, with, you know, with regard to people of color, where, um, you know, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that, you know, there's a lot of racial bias that um, are shared among, you know, folks that might be brought in as police officers. The other really disturbing story, when I was part of the Rethinking School Discipline sort of set of conveners, um, under the Obama administration, uh, many, this was not just one, but many uh, uh, chiefs of police would tell stories of how they used to be in support of, you know, officer friendly, but found that when push came to shove, the officers that got assigned to schools were the least capable and often the ones they wanted off the streets. And that was really <laughs> disturbing to hear. So, um, you know, we, there's very little oversight and we're not seeing the data, even though it's required to really understand um, the situation as well as we, we should. But where we do have the data, we see very large racial and display disparities in, in terms of who's being referred to law enforcement. Um, and often it is for minor offenses, um, things that get escalated. So, you know, there's a lot of anecdotal data uh, and not a lot of good quality data to really unpack the situation. Thanks, Dan. So, so Dan, oh, yeah, what? we're go ahead, Larissa. I was just going to say we are oh, yeah. um, we're closing in on ten o'clock. So I was going to uh, suggest that Larissa kind of um, pick one more question and uh, before we wrap up, we've got a lot of folks who stayed on, which is a real testament to the importance of this topic and to the wisdom that you're bringing, Dan. But um, Maybe one, time for one more question, Larissa. Okay, yeah, I was go actually um, going to see, I think there's a lot of specific questions here, Dan, um, that I was wondering if you'd be okay with us maybe compiling a list. People have questions about specific data analysis techniques, about specific uh, laws or legal, um, legal questions. And I'm wondering if you'd be willing to answer um, questions for our attendees, um, maybe over email or yeah. um, later on, and then we could post um, post some of those later. Yep. Would absolutely. that be okay? I have my uh, email address and phone number. I don't know if you can still see my screen, but if you can, 
um, it's the last slide. And uh, I think we're going to post this. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. Right. So um, if your question did not get um, answered, uh, I, there were just so many great questions and I was trying to um, compile the ones that were similar to, to one another um, to try to have this broader discussion, but we will make sure that we are posting um, the answers to some of these other questions. So thank you so much for your engagement. What I do want, um, there was one question that was um, for the Smart Center um, as opposed to Dan specifically. So I just want to address that um, quickly. So someone asked how the Smart Center is addressing, um, addressing issues of disproportionality and culturally responsive mental health specifically. Um, and we do have a number of projects. It was exciting to hear Dan talk about the need for um, for relationship building. Um, we have a project called Relate, which focuses, it's an equity explicit student teacher relationship um, intervention that has both concrete strategies for um, improving student teacher relationships as well as concrete strategies for reducing implicit bias. And those are all integrated into um, one program and one project that's being evaluated in high schools um, now. Um, there's a project um, specifically focused on reducing disproportionality and um, a process for self-evaluating practices that might be related to disproportionality and really going through an intentional process of, um, of selecting a domain with which to then intervene on. Um, because it can feel really overwhelming, you see that there might be all of these issues of disproportionality within your school and district, and it's hard to find a way to move forward with that. Um, and I don't know if Mike has anything he wants to add for that project, but I know Frida is also online and maybe can speak to one other project um, that we have that specifically addresses this as well as we're trying to do a better job at the Smart Center of looking at our data for a lot of the disproportionate effects that, that we and Dan and others suggest schools look at. Um, we're trying to take that approach as well to a lot of our projects. So quickly, Frida, you want to uh, say a sentence or two, and then we're just going to say thank you so much and sign off here. Sure, and, and that's, Dolores is referring to the Vibrant Project in which we're developing or have developed a brief uh, self-guided interactive online intervention. And when we say brief, we think about 45 minutes for school-based mental health providers. And again, it's uh, specifically to target um, implicit bias among school-based mental health providers, and we teach them some very specific strategies uh, to use, and we're currently running a tiny pilot feasibility study, um, and I have, I, I just barely have a little bit of the data analyzed, so we're very excited to see, uh, to be looking at our results. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Frida. So, I think without further ado, thank you so much, Dan. Thanks, Eric and Kelsey and Megan and everyone. And thank you all for being here and we'll be in touch. We're gonna upload slides and we're gonna make sure we get some of these other questions answered. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Yep. Thank you all so much for being part of the first virtual Smart Center speaker series event. And thanks, Dan, for being our, um, our, our inaugural guest. Um, we look forward to interacting with many of you in the future. Feel free to go to our website and ask us questions at any time. Have a great Wednesday.